Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of New Books Network. Today, I'm honored to be speaking with Professor David M. Henkin about a wonderful book he published with the Yale University Press in 2021. The book is called The Week, A History of Unnatural Rhythms That Made Us Who We Are. Uh, Professor David Henkin is a Margaret Byrne Professor of History at the University of California, Berkeley. His previous books include The Postal Age, City Reading, uh, Becoming America, A History for the 21st Century. Uh, David, welcome to New Books Network. Thank you very much. It's lovely to be here. All right. Uh, it's such a fascinating topic, the week, a uh, history of unnatural rhythms that made us who we are. And before coming across the book, I simply took it for granted. A week had uh, always existed. Uh, but before talking about the book, can you please just briefly introduce yourself, tell us about your expertise, and more importantly, why you decided to write a book about the week? Okay, so I'm a, I'm a historian, and my training and background is in the history of the United States in the 19th century. I would say that I'm a social and cultural historian, which I guess means that I study the experiences and the mentalities uh, of ordinary people in 19th century United States. Um, and so in a way, I got interested in the week because I was struck in my research into those people's lives uh, at how many of them seemed to care uh, not only about things like weekend or Sabbath, but seemed to have lives where it made a difference, whether it was Tuesday or Wednesday. And so I began to wonder whether that was new. Um, and I began to wonder whether that was actually a, a, a fundamental part of the modern experience of timekeeping for them and maybe more generally for, for, for other, other people in the West. I should add that I uh, personally have always been interested in the week in part because um, I grew up as uh, in a family of uh, that observed traditional Jewish practices, and uh, the week was very important not only to um, the, the Saturday Sabbath, but also uh, more generally, it, it's a prominent feature of the Jewish calendar. But I noticed that everyone else seemed to care about the week also, and so I, I've always wondered about this institution because it is an unnatural rhythm. In other words, it's not; it's the only. Uh, only timekeeping unit that we have that isn't either a that isn't either itself a link to a natural observable cycle or is a uh, a fraction of that right so you know why do people observe weeks i mean i had some ideas to why traditional jews or maybe muslims or christians also uh cared about the week but more generally why are we also attached to what to what day of the week it is. Mm. And uh, in your introduction, you use the word technology to refer to the idea of a week. It's a form of technology. What, what do you mean by that? Well, it's a somewhat, it's a somewhat sort of a provocative use of the term. I could call it a tool or, or, mm. or a device. I'm trying to call attention to the fact that it is something artificial and created. Um, but I actually also think of it uh, as really a technology in the sense that it's the application of a certain systematic way of thinking about the the given world uh, and an attempt to order it through through a set of tools. Um, so it's 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 a timekeeping device in some ways, like 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 a clock is, uh, um, but it's a different kind of one because it doesn't uh, measure something that people actually think are is out there. It's just a uh, a system of counting cycles and tracking those cycles. Uh, it doesn't involve a machine, and often we think of technologies as 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 about machinery. Um, but it but it is a device and a tool, and it involves the application uh, of a device and a tool uh, to the to the given world. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm interested to know a little bit about the scope of your research, and also maybe I should start by asking. So the idea of a week seven day week a seven day week did it exist for example in 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 roman calendar or in during medieval times or yes. is it something more of a phenomenon that become that became a thing in the uh, 19th century so that may be the first part of my question the second part is that you you started the book with the concept of week in north america so i'm interested to know why um you started that particular region to do your research okay so let me take the first question so uh, the week is very old technology. 
It's uh, and by by week, what I mean is um, a regular cycle of seven days um, uh, that is uh, always recurring and has there's no breaks uh, um, and is uh, used by people as a social calendar system. So I, it's quite old. Um, it's only in the last 150 years that I would say it's become pretty much universal. Uh, but uh, but for 2000 years, uh, various peoples have have counted cycles of seven days. The Romans did um, in they counted also cycles of eight days and, and other cycles as well. But they uh, they did count cycles of seven days. It wasn't such a meaningful social calendar. In other words, uh, things nothing happened on every Tuesday. Uh, they did count it. Um, as Tuesday, or they, they connected it with the planet Mars, which is the origin of, of the word Tuesday and, for example, most, yeah. Indo most but not all Indo-European Indo languages. Uh, but they did count it, so that seems like a week. Um, and, and we know that Jews counted a week also uh, and observed a Sabbath week. Mm -hmm. um, and in the Roman Empire, those two, those two sort of weekly uh calendars which is essentially had separate origins um converged and then through christianity spread to significant parts of the mediterranean world um and then later to the americas and through from islam to into places like 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 west africa uh and then through imperialism to many parts of the world mm -hmm. and then from global capitalism to all parts of of of, of the world so people have observed weeks for two for 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 2000 years. So, um, and in some ways that's a little bit misleading because then we assume that the week does the same thing in every society and whatever the week did for Romans or for Jews in the Roman empire, it must be the thing that it does for people, you know, in, in Australia in, uh, in, in the 20th century or 21st century. And, and that's not necessarily true. So I'm looking at the 19th century because I think that is when the week began to assume, uh, a new function in addition to the old functions and my book is a little bit about that new mm. function um, now as to why I locate it in North America. Uh, really, the reason is I felt like I can only figure out for 19th century North America uh, whether and to what extent ordinary people cared about the week, um, because that's the only society in which I have enough of a background in uh, in in the lives of ordinary people to be able to to test to test such a claim. So in a way, I'm saying this happened in North America, and it could well have happened and probably did to some extent in many other urbanized industrializing societies in the 19th in, in the 19th century. But I'm not in, in, a, in a position to sort of prove that from from scratch. But there are a couple other reasons. One um, has to do with going back from 19th century America, which is that uh, the United States in the early 19th century was a much more weak oriented society than, for example, Europe at the time. Uh, it was a society where the weekly rhythms were more conspicuous uh, uh, relative to the Gregorian calendar, relative to months and dates than they were, say, in places like France or, 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 or Germany. So it seemed likely that, that the United States would be an early uh, an, a, a good early test case of how this transition took place. And then at the other end, at the other end of the 19th century, the United States plays an outsized role um, through global capitalism in, in spreading the week. So it, it makes some sense in, for two different reasons to think of the United States as a possible vanguard for the new uses of the week that I'm interested in. But again, I, 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 uh, it's, it's really that I, I think I can kind of prove it for you know, ordinary people and living in the U.S. say in the 1830s or 40s, and 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 I, I can't do that um, say for 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 England, though uh, you do see some parallel developments there. Yeah, yeah. and uh, you you talk about the influence of several astronomical models, also religious traditions, but we'll talk about religious traditions a little bit later in the interview. So I'm interested to know the influence or the impact of astronomical or hemorological models on the concept of a week? How did it change the way people perceive the idea of a week? Okay, so the first interesting thing to, that we want to point out is that uh, 
the idea of a Sabbath week, we call it a, a dominical model of the week, where there are six ordinary days, or maybe five, but let's say six ordinary days, and then one special day, is really different from uh, the Roman astrological week, which associated each day with a different planet or a different god, um, and didn't elevate one day above all others, and didn't homogenize six days and treat them all, all all the same. Uh, that conception, the astrological conception of the week, tended not toward thinking about uh, separating work from leisure or separating sacred from profane time, but instead suggested that every day has a distinctive character. And typically societies that have had calendars that assign distinctive character to each day uh, engaged in the th the thing that I, we call hemorology, which is the tracking of um, fortunate and unfortunate days, you know, good days to get married, you know, lots of societies that that that, uh, that don't haven't observed the seven day week did have hemorological calendars. Uh, Japan, for example, which is a very late adopter of the seven day week has a very long standing astrological cycle of six days that continues to determine among traditional people when to get married. Uh, Mexico, uh, for example, which did not um, use a seven day cycle in, until um, until U European encounter and, 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 uh, um, and colonization uh, had traditions of hemorology, good and bad days. So did West Africa, very complex grids of, of auspicious and auspicious days. So I think that the fact that the week through the Roman calendar has that heritage um, uh, shapes, shapes the modern week, though it's, it's a much older, and I think in some ways a diminishing uh, feature of the, the modern week for us, for most people in the 21st century is not a grid of lucky and unlucky days. For the people that I studied in 19th century America, it still was that. I mean, both Europeans and Africans uh, um, brought to uh, North America traditions uh, that attached days of the week to, to omens, uh, to, you know, ill omens and, 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 and good omens, and you see it a lot. I mean, it's preserved a little bit in folklore about lucky and unlucky days to get married, you know, or, you know, Wednesday's child, that kind of stuff. There are lucky and unlucky days to cut your nails or to, or to sneeze. Um, but probably the, the biggest uh, uh, evidence of it in 19th century America was the idea that Friday was a bad luck day. Um, something that's preserved in the 21st, 21st century, um, you know, uh, Anglo-American culture in the idea of Friday the 13th. The unlucky number matched with the unlucky day, um, but probably has roots in other places, including uh, the crucifixion uh, mm. of Jesus. Um, but in any case, uh, uh, lots of different kinds of people in 19th century America would refer to the uh, problem of Friday. A bad luck day to, to be born, a bad luck day to get married, an inauspicious day to embark on a voyage or, or to initiate a business project. Right. It's an interesting point you brought up because in my culture, you know, in Islamic Canada, there are a couple of months that you won't get married because they are they're kind of they have religious significant significance. And I don't remember what day I got married myself. I'm kind of curious now to go back and look. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. In, in, in the Jewish calendar, there are periods where you don't get married also, uh, typically because they're associated with mourning. Mm, um, yeah. But, you know, in the commentaries on that in the Jewish tradition, even there is the idea that it's not just disrespectful to get married, uh, but that it's in some ways the marriage was is less likely to succeed or the business yeah. venture is less likely. So, mm. so the idea of there being fortunate and unfortunate times uh, is, I think, pretty... Uh, extensive i hesitate to say universal but is a, is is a, is a pretty common feature of calendaring more generally mm. um and the seven day week retains features of that but i would say of all the things that a week does and that's one of them uh that's the one that's the least modern both in the sense that it is not distinctive to the last couple hundred years but also in the sense that it is uh, rapidly being eclipsed or was rapidly ecl eclipsed in the 19th century by mm. other uses of the week. Yeah. And I do remember when I was a kid, I don't remember exactly what, but I certainly do remember there were things I uh, I was told uh, I'd better not do on some particular days, something even as, you know, just, you know, short, uh, cutting your nails. 
you, you, you're right. So when you were talking about that, I was just reminded of some childhood mm -hmm. memories that I had. But anyway, uh, what, what was the contribution of the Protestant tradition on the idea of the week? Okay, well, so, so the, uh, the idea of a Sabbath, uh, which was originally a Jewish, um, a Jewish practice, uh, is probably the most influential um, historical contribution to this technology. And, um, and I'll say in a, in a moment why, what's specifically Protestant, but broadly speaking, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and to a lesser extent, Islam only because um, Islam has a, a dominical week in the sense that there's one day, Friday, that is um, set aside from all the others, uh, primarily for things like, like prayer. Uh, it was not in the same way a day of of rest as it was for for Jews and from for many Christians, but 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 in all three of those religions, the setting aside of one day is uh, the principal thing that the week does, and that still is, I think, for most people, that's the dominant thing we associate with the week: the idea that there's a weekend, that there's a climactic day or set of days uh, that are special and render all the other days kind of the same. Um, and so that was big. I actually think of that as an industrial timekeeping system, even though it's much older than industrialization, but it's industrial in its logic in the sense that it creates a firm temporal separation between work and leisure, especially in a, in a, in a religion where, where that special day is a day where, where labor is taboo, um, such as Judaism and many forms of Christianity. Uh, so in that sense, it, it, it was very well suited to industrialization when industrialization happened, because it was already, uh, you know, the, the idea we have is that before industrialization, work had very informal spatial and temporal boundaries. You worked often in the same places in the same times we did other things that would later be cordoned off as leisure or or uh, family life or intimacy or recreation or whatever. Um, um, so industrialization came in and said, well, actually, no, work and uh, is going to be a, a separate space and a safe and a separate time. Well, the week had already in some ways done that. So the week was uh, oddly a very congenial uh, timekeeping system for industrialization. <laughs> And that's a big contribution. The fact that the United States was a Protestant and, a, and a, I would say a, an especially Protestant society in many ways in its in its origins, right, in, it, in it, its early period is significant because, um, and I'll use the word Protestant, but, but, but I specifically mean um, uh, Protestant societies that really reject, unlike the, the Anglican church, that really rejected saints days and feast days and many features of the of of the of the catholic or, or orthodox calendar uh, those societies were especially weak oriented because the calendar was stripped bare of so many other things so in the united states say in 1800 um, the weekly calendar was much more conspicuous because the annual calendar was so was so impoverished in other words in uh, Catholic Europe, there were like dozens and dozens of annual festivals, saints days, fast days, feast days. So you really had to know what date it was to know what your life was gonna be like that day, right? So uh, especially in places like New England, uh, where every, almost every annual day, including December 25th, had been stripped from the calendar and regarded as a sort of, you know, Catholic or pagan um, heresy, the only calendar that really mattered was the weekly calendar that told you whether it was a work day or not that told you uh what kind of church service you ought to attend that that told you er, told you everything you needed to know about the day so the united states in 1800 was an especially weak oriented society because it was protestant and especially because of its puritan um uh puritan background puritans were sabbatarians so this may be a little bit too much in the theological weeds but Briefly, Sabbatarians, uh, unlike most Protestants in England, um, regarded Sunday as rooted in the biblical Sabbath. So from that perspective, um, the commandment in the Hebrew Bible to keep the seventh day holy was the origin of the Sabbath. It's just that that day had been moved from the seventh day to the first day, had been moved from Saturday 
to Sunday. Whereas lots of other uh, Christians um, in England and certainly lots of non-Protestants uh, didn't see it that way. They saw Sunday was the Lord's day. It was the commemoration of the resurrection and its relationship to the to the biblical Sabbath was like attenuated or almost even erased. So uh, that meant that Sabbatarians uh, really were strict about thinking about Sunday as a day which you shouldn't work. So that also contributed to uh, to our modern uh, sense of of weekday weekend. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, let's talk about the Industrial Revolution. So Industrial Revolution took place. The society became more commercialized, industrialized. Urbanization was uh, expanding. I know that it's a very broad topic. You've written a whole chapter on that. But how did it in general contribute to the idea of a seven-day week? Okay, so the seven-day week is in place, and industrialization mm. did two different kinds of things. Industrialization of production, which is usually what, what we mean by that term, I think really just hardened the, the borders between weekday and weekend. So it sort of doubled down on, on the Jewish and Christian idea of a Sabbath uh, by, um, well, like I said, making making much clearer what time is work time, what time is leisure, leisure time. So to give one classic example, uh, Monday in uh, pre-industrial Britain and to some extent pre-industrial America as well was in, an informal work day, often referred to typically by employers as Saint Monday or Blue Monday, a day where where workers wouldn't show up or would show up drunk or would work at a more more leisurely pace. Uh, and industrialization sought to tighten the boundary between Sunday and Monday and make Monday a real work day, just like Tuesday. Right. Uh, so industrialization did that. It also, in a way, contributed to the rise of a two-day weekend because uh, it, um, uh, over a longer period of time, in, uh, in, inspired unions to uh, to begin to demand more uh, restrictions on their working hours, and that led to fights over Saturday, which ultimately, in the 20th century, um, workers won that fight. So that's one contribution. But the bigger contribution, I think, is not exactly in the industrialization of production, but is the other things you mentioned, commercialization and urbanization. Uh, so in a society with more commercial encounters between strangers, um, the week turned out to be a useful device uh, in ways that it hadn't been before, because what the week allowed people to do uh, was to um, schedule activities, commercial activities, but also uh, also social activities, other kinds of activities, uh, to schedule them with the weekly calendar. And that turned out to be uh, what I would call a, a remarkably um, a remarkably successful technology at coordinating the activities of strangers. So when people began living in societies of strangers and they began um, purchasing printed newspapers and going to commercial entertainment and joining uh, joining voluntary associations, but also going banking and shopping and doing all these act activities that required some kind of calendar coordination among strangers, uh, the week was was useful. So organization would say, we will meet every Tuesday or we'll meet the first Wednesday of every month, or our bank will do business every Monday and Wednesday, and this bank will do every Tuesday or Thursday, and our newspaper will come out every every Thursday, uh, the mail will be delivered every Saturday and Wednesday, uh, school will have a half day off on Wednesday. So, so there were lots of things in a society of strangers that were scheduled to the week. And in many ways, I think that's actually the, the most powerful grip that the modern week has on our uh, on our on our rhythms, but also the most powerful grip it has on our memory, on our ability to sort of to mentally map time, both uh, prospectively and even retrospectively. And uh, apart from industrialization and commercial commercialization, you you talk about other things that was happening in the nineteenth century: the role of, for example, domestic sphere, schools, clubs, newspapers. And you have a section for each one of these things. Uh, so I'll leave it to you, which ones you want to talk, talk about. I'm personally more interested to know about the role of domestic experience and uh, maybe yeah. social clubs or things like communication means like uh, newspaper to see how they 
kind of changed our perception of the idea of the week. Yeah, so they're, they're all a little different, which is why I break them up in, in the book. Some of those, and especially in newspapers, one could subsume under the, under the rubric of commerce, right? So those are things people buy on a, on, a, on, a, on a weekly schedule. But their impact, let's take newspapers for a second before I go to the domestic, their, their impact um, is not just about commerce, it's about uh, the perception of a news cycle or the way you think about your reading habits. Um, there are still people who subscribe to to print weekly magazines that arrive in the mail once a week, and it shapes their experience not only of 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 how regularly they expect to have new information, but also how they think about their their reading habits and their use of leisure time. So, in general, like a, something like a newspaper is just a, yet another example of uh, the spread of commercial culture and its use of of weekly periodicity. Um, to sell things, um, but it's it's a particularly interesting one because of of how people then uh, you know, parcel out there. Uh, okay, D domesticity is is interesting because that really is in many ways about labor, and one of those interesting things is that uh, although the week is a, is a good industrial uh, timekeeping device for separating week and weekend, you know, separating labor and and leisure, it also can be a good industrial device for segregating tasks within the week. In other words, any task that you want done once a, once a week, and uh, the weekly calendar will you know, let you space them out and do them in regular intervals. But the sector of, of labor that first adopted this in the United States was domestic labor. Um, in other words, it's a sector of labor you usually don't think of as industrializing in the sense that um, it often wasn't paid by hourly wages. Some of it wasn't paid at all. Uh, the home was romanticized as a haven from from the, the heartless industrial uh, world. But in fact, uh, fairly early in the 1800s, uh, uh, American homemakers and especially American domesticity guides, people who told other people how best to do it, sought to rationalize and in that sense, industrialize the project of um, of cleaning and maintaining a home or of supervising um, domestic servants. And they early on um, began preaching the utility of a weekly schedule, which typically went that you washed on Monday, you ironed on Tuesday, you baked on Wednesday, and then there was a little bit of variation. And they would sometimes debate whether the best day to wash was actually Monday or Tuesday. Or some people thought it should, it should be Friday or Saturday, but mostly Monday. And Monday became washing day, um, uh, and that reflected a couple of things. On one hand, it reflected a rising standard of hygiene uh, in the in 18th century or in, in colonial America um, or in 18th century England, for, the, for that matter. People did not expect to wash their clothes at seven day intervals. It was not thought of as necessary to say wash your shirts. Uh, that frequently, but um, with rising uh, aspirations to gentility and changes in the textile industry, et cetera, uh, expectations of wearing a clean shirt in particular um, uh, spread and intensified. Uh, and then quickly that sort of became the anchor of a, of a, a weekly household r regime where, uh, you know, independent homemakers or their domestic servants uh, would coordinate their activities so that every day had a distinctive work character. Um, and it really is at the vanguard of that. S schools might be a second, uh, like a second sector uh, where schools also, if you think of that as work, which I do, um, began uh, assigning particular classes or particular examinations or particular activities on different days of the week. Uh, but it was it was actually uh, women and children who I think were at the vanguard of of this use of of of, of the industrial week again not to separate work days from rest days uh, but to uh, determine the particular character of the individual work days. And when I was reading your book, I was really amazed uh, and also quite surprised because I didn't know that's also a valuable source that you could refer to. You choose diaries to investigate the change in people's habits uh, in response to this concept of the week. So I'm interested to know uh, why you chose that source or those sources, and also how 
how did people's habits change as 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 a result of all these changes and the idea of the week? So diaries are are I think a a, a rich and complicated source. They do two things. One thing is um, uh, diary keeping became a uh, very popular activity. I mean, not just elite people began keeping diaries regularly in the 19th century, and they're very well preserved. Uh, people thought to keep them, and they wind up in in um, you know, historical societies and archives across across the country. So they really are the best uh, source we have for ordinary things, for things that people did uh, that seemed notable to them in the moment, but wouldn't show up, for example, in a memoir or, you know, or other kinds of historical records. Because, I mean, imagine, I don't know if you keep a diary, but if, if you did, the thing that seems worth recording about your day today, whether it be the weather or what happened at work or, or how many hours you, uh, you slept, uh, is not anything you would recall, let alone, you know, record. Uh, uh, if you were writing about your life a year from now. So they're a great source in that way. But in a way, they're also part of the story because the spread of diary keeping was also the spread of a certain kind of timekeeping. Uh, 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 using a diary um, is a little bit like using a clock uh, or any other kind of calendar. It's, it's a way in which you, you yourself keep track of time. So the fact that people began using diaries uh, uh, not only shows us what they were doing, but also shows us how they were thinking about time. Um, so for example, um, I looked at diaries to determine whether people saw fit to write down what day of the week it was, right? I mean, that, if they're using a blank book diary and they're just writing, uh, how do they identify the day? Do, do they just use the date? Do they just use the day of the week? Do they use both? Uh, so that's sort of interesting. Um, uh, if they do use the day, then you know it, at least that they know what day it is. Uh, and then the question is, are they correct? I spent a little bit of time looking at cases where the day and the date don't align, so you know that one of them is not right. And then you try to use internal evidence to figure out which is right. That tells you something. I mean, um, I'd say in the society that I live in, my guess is the one that you live in, in, in Melbourne also, we are much more confident and much more accurate in our, um, in our sense of what day of the week it is than our sense of what date of the month it is right now if I, I i'll if i ask a classroom and classroom is maybe a, a, a sort of skewed example because classes tend to meet on a weekly schedule uh, how many of you are confident what day of day of the week it is they haven't raised their hand i've asked them how many of you are confident what date of the month it is and half of them won't right unless it happens to be you know birthday or their rent is due or or there's something memorable uh, uh about the date um they'll have to think about it. Most of us often look at our phones or devices to see what date it is. We don't look at our phones or devices mm -hmm. to see what day of the week it is because uh, for many of us, unless we're retired or, or sick or something like that, um, or it's COVID, uh, um, many of us actually really need to know. And if you don't know what day of the week it, it is, or if you're wrong about it, mm -hmm. um, it can occasion often pretty to serious missed appointments, but also it's regarded as a as a symptom of of temporal disorientation. That's why we people got so upset about Blur's Day during the pandemic shutdown. Or what day is it? Uh, you know, you, we feel like we need to know. We need to, to and then also it's considered a, often a sign of cognitive decline. If you, anyway, that's uh, so um, so the, the diary kind of let me know a little bit about whether people cared and whether they knew what day of the week it is. And then the fact that diary, that printed diaries proliferated is another piece of historical uh, evidence. Pre-formatted pre uh, diaries as opposed to uh, it's a pocket sized showing about six or seven days on a spread um, it was an innovation. It's different from the almanac. In the 18th century, Americans owned almanacs. Almanacs are organized around the month, not the week. Uh, and they arrayed dates vertically you know, from say January 1st mm -hmm. to January 31st. Um, in the 19th century, suddenly people began uh, buying these pocket-sized pre-formatted pre diaries that uh, privileged the week because they usually showed six or seven days on a spread. Uh, and, um, and they usually gave a consistent spot in the little book to, uh, to a given day of the week. So the mere fact that that 
that that became a mass consumer good uh, really around the 1830s, 1840s is yet another piece of evidence, not only that people wanted to know what day of the week it is, but that people knew because they were using essentially a calendar that constantly reminded them what day of the week it was. So diaries do so many different things um, for, for historians. Uh, for me, they did double duty because they were both uh, the best guide I had to what people's lives were like and schedules and also the best guide I had to how they were keeping time. I mean, it, it's almost, yeah. Uh, when you talk about the idea of losing track of the dates, maybe or sometimes even day, depending on um, depending on the circumstances, I, I guess it's a perfect segue to my next question. But I do remember that during COVID curfew, so I live in Melbourne and it had uh, one of the toughest curfews uh, compared to anywhere else in the world, I guess, or 200 days. And there were months that we couldn't even uh, travel further than five kilometers away from our home. But anyway, I, 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 I used to have that feel which you earlier talked about. So Friday has a feel, it has this affect, you know, it's the last day of the week. But that feel was completely gone because to me, for a few months, every day had the same feel. And I just knew that I had to, you know, uh, turn on my computer and start working. But the weekends really didn't, uh, weren't any different from the weekdays for me because I couldn't go anywhere. And it was just simply being able to sleep more, which was getting monotonous. But anyway, so this idea of being conscious of the idea of time and the week. So you talk about the idea of flight of time. That becomes a thing maybe. But were people conscious of this idea of flight of time, that time is passing kind of quickly? How did it change with, with the consolidation of the idea of uh, the week? So it's interesting. Um, I, I would say two things. One is that there, uh, there was, especially in uh, Puritan societies within the United States in the early 19th century, already a tradition of every Sunday looking back on your week and what you had gotten done or failed to do. Mm -hmm. And so one thing I noticed in lots of 19th century diaries is that on Saturday night, uh, there are a lot of people saying another week has come and gone, my time, my time on earth is so fleeting, et cetera. Lots of sort of, you know, uh, theological, or cosmological, existential reflections on how fast time is that would happen on, 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 on Saturday night. So I tried to think about like, you know, what does that mean? And, uh, and would that intensify in the modern period? Uh, well, one simple thing you could say is that the, um, the week is a much shorter, unit of time uh, than the month or the year or the season or, or anything else that's that we attend to that's bigger than a day. So if part of the story of the modern world is is that people care much more about the week relative to the month than they used to right, in societies that 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 organize themselves, especially around a lunar month, um, uh, you know, or, or, if, or the, the, ebb, the ebb and flow of, of tides or things like that. The month is really important. Um, and there, you know, there, and there, there are other societies even, even uh, that use, uh, use the Gregorian calendar where the month is very important. Uh, the more the week really distinguishes one day from another, not just Saturday and Sunday from the other, it even distinguishes Tuesday from Wednesday. The more that's the principal grid of, of uh, temporal difference that you're attuned to, then the recurrence of another day in that cycle is really going to make you aware, oh, time is passing. Um, so a short seven-day cycle, I think, psychologically has some kind of tendency um, to make uh, time seem like it's flying by more so than the month. I mean, obviously, less so than the day. So you, know, you could have you could have a, a psychological disposition where every time you went to sleep, you thought, oh my God, it's nighttime again, right? How, um, and some people probably do. Uh, but increasing consciousness of the seven day cycle seems to have triggered a lot more reflections, especially at week's end of the swift passing of, of time, which as I said, uh, American Protestants were a little bit already predisposed to do because there was something of a tradition of of, of uh, looking back on the week and sort of taking taking stock, you know, moral accounting. I talk about it a little bit in the book also. Yeah. And uh, so you 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 talk your book is mainly about North America, but you also talk about the idea of a week maybe traveling to other parts of the world, such as 
China and the Middle East. How did it, this idea come about? Well, um, I mean, the standard way in which uh, the story gets told is that because the week is a, is a Christian institution, uh, then it's like the imposition of the Gregorian calendar mm, yeah. onto, say, the Islamic calendar or the Chinese calendar. Mm. Uh, uh, and then the week comes with that. Mm. Uh, and that's sort of true. Um, um, but it's different. The, the, uh, the weekly calendar is actually not part of the Gregorian calendar. And lots of parts of the world, like the, like the Muslim world, had the week and not the Gregorian calendar. And so the Gregorian calendar was really the, 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 sort of the, the, the imposition. Um, but the global spread of the week, I think, is much more about, about capitalism and is much more about the forms of coordination uh, that... Um, that cap capital you know commodity exchange and especially information exchange uh, uh seems to to either require or encourage or reinforce so the more the more uh the more business was done across greater geographical distances uh the more um useful it was to have a coordinated work schedule or a coordinated calendar of some sort and that's what the week was so good at doing in the modern world was coordinating schedules among strangers and it, it did so on, on, a, on a global on a global scale the other thing one could say and i'm you know i'm not 100 percent sure that i buy this but that uh, um the week took root pretty quickly in societies where it had no real precedent because it's a really useful calendar either it's useful because a regular cycle of work and rest is better than one that is, you know, uh, irregularly embedded into a lunar month or something like that, uh, or because the forms of social coordination that it permits to to have like families or you know friends have the same days off, uh, that that kind of thing is is useful. Uh, so that'd be the other way of thinking about it. You know, the 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 week was introduced through imperialism and and colonialism um, and uh, and the opening of markets, etc. And then it stuck because it's a good calendar. I think that's a plausible argument. But I, I think it's clear that the week is a useful uh, calendar for coordinating commercial activity. I think that's probably enough to explain why, uh, why let's say, the Japanese um, adopted quite quickly and, uh, it seems, successfully. What about the idea of time zones and universal time scheme? How did they begin in the States? So um, there, there, there are two. I, it, it's a, it, it, the answer is it took place in the second half of the nineteenth century in the United States and in many parts of of the Western world and ultimately the non Western world as well. It has two features. One is uh, the idea of a um, mean time zone, mm -hmm. and the other is the internationalization of it. And right. so the uh, the mean time zone itself is an interesting thing. So uh, according to the sun, it's noon, you know, one moment in San Francisco, and it's actually noon at a different moment in Oakland. Hmm. And that's okay. Uh, in 1800. Because who cares, right? I mean, you know, uh, but with the railroad and telegraph, uh, we do start to care not only between Oakland and San Francisco, but even between say San Francisco and um, well, between let's say Chicago and 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 St. Louis, uh, differences in la longitude and 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 and, and latitude uh, are significant there. And uh, if you want to have, do a commercial transaction, know what time it, it took place at, say for a commodity uh, commodity sale, or if you wanted to to time two railroads using the same tracks that they don't collide with each other, you actually have to be on the same clock. So. Um, uh, Railroads and uh, and boards of trade were really at the forefront of pushing for uh, some kind of standardization, so that Chicago and St. Louis would would be on the same clock. In order for them to do that, you have to decide whose clock dominates who. So the first move is to take the biggest city in an area and say that everyone will uh, will uh, abide by its clock. But ultimately, it became more popular. Uh, for in many parts of the world, including in the United States, to say, no, no, we're just going to take the mean l longitude of a 
certain area uh, and say that everyone within that zone will adopt the, the, the solar time of that mean point. So Chicago and St. Louis are now not operating on either Chicago time or St. Louis time. They're arguing, they're operating on some time that actually is, uh, you know, further, mm. further west than both of them. And, 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 and everyone in the whole area does that. So the internationalization of that is the decision then just to, to, to think of each of those zones as, as about 1 24th of, of the globe. Uh, and then set a central point, which was set in Greenwich, England, uh, and and have all the zones somehow oriented around that, and then create a date line that's the that's antipodal to Greenwich, England, somewhere in the Pacific Ocean, uh, uh, where it won't really be confusing for um, uh, for a local population. But you put it in the ocean, uh, and and that process spread between 1884 and I'd say by 19, by 1917, 1918, it's pretty much uh, uh, codified in law in, um, in most parts of the world that there will be an international timekeeping system. Uh, and it's essentially the, the, the imposition of, uh, of artificial time over real solar time in order to, to facilitate and coordinate uh, exchanges between strangers. And uh, one final question I have is more about modern times. Uh, for example, right now it's a public holiday here in Australia, but I'm talking to you or I sometimes interview academics, you know, on Saturday or Sunday, I send emails. The idea of week uh, or time might have kind of changed because of the rise of the internet and digitalization and there was this famous book some time ago 24 7 if i'm not mistaken yeah, but anyway exactly. what, what do you think the rise of this digitalization and the internet how does how do you think it has kind of affected maybe our temporal borders i think it's significant i mean i i, I think it it follows from my argument uh which is uh that the modern week is crucially a, a technology of co of coordination. If that's right, well, then it's got to make some difference to to our experience of 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 the week. All of the forces that that seem to disrupt that. So one of them, as you said, is is telecommunication, which um, means that I'm talking to you on a Thursday, I think, but you think that we're talking on a Friday, and so um, the week isn't actually being helpful at all in our coordination. Um, that, that, that's one thing. Um, telecommuting is another one, right? So, uh, our experience of, of days of the week as associated with places would seem to be disrupted if we actually are not always, um, in the same place every day of the week, even if we're working at the same activity, that makes a difference. Uh, com it changes commute patterns, which are also part of our sense of the week. M most of us, you know, we, you, you, uh, you think about, about traffic, uh, pedestrian traffic, as well as bike traffic, and certainly car traffic as connected to the week. That's probably being disrupted. Um, here's another one. Uh, I'll give you two more examples I think are very important that we don't think so much about, but uh, asynchronous entertainment. You know, especially for people uh, uh, who grew up in the last quarter of the 20th century, um, the week was anchored very much by entertainment schedules you certain pro programs appeared on certain days of the week and that's what anchored your sense of place in the week uh now with the colossally important exception of um spectator sports uh our commercial entertainment tends to be asynchronous in other words we stream uh television programs um whenever we want to we go to we see movies at odd times of the day or week. We don't like wait for the Wednesday matinee or for a Friday uh, premiere or things like that. Uh, so that ought to make a difference. And then the other th the other thing that I think is actually a sort of an uh, underrated significance is uh, electronic calendaring, because one of the great things that the week did in the modern world is allowed us to to uh, sequester or regularize and also remember our appointments. You know, I know I, I'm a, if I'm going to have lunch with this person, it's always going to be on a Wednesday or, uh, you know, my uh, availability to see a client is always going to be on a, on a Monday. Um, 
we needed that. We needed that both to, to figure out the frequency and also to, to know when we were free and know when we're not free. Um, but if our electronic calendars can do all that for us without it, without our even having to remember it. In other words, uh, you know, if you and I want, want, want to make a set of lunch appointments and our calendars can just without even our knowing or, or our thinking about it, just populate and communicate. Uh, and then suddenly we have three or four lunches planned for the next few months and they're on random days of, of, of the week or month, but our calendars can know that we're free. And then I don't even have to remember it, just like, well, I mean, this is not actually true because I don't use an electronic calendar, but if I did, um, then I, I wouldn't need to know when, when, whether we were lunching on a Wednesday or a Thursday. I would just uh, every day look at my schedule and, you know, uh, so all of those things should actually uh, at least attenuate the grip that the week has on us. Um, but on the other hand, uh, the week persists and uh, there's very little um, interest in uh, abandoning it as a basis of scheduling for all kinds of other activities uh, and all attempts to do so all historical attempts to reform or abolish the week um, in any way um, ha ha have really failed and the pandemic shutdown which made us uh, uh, talk a lot about how we didn't know what day of the week it was when it probably shouldn't have mattered uh, suggests that our, our mental maps of time are still so weak oriented that it will take a lot more than the things that you and I just mentioned to dislodge us from from the week uh, that uh, even those of us who don't actually you know who, who lead the kind of 24 7 life that Jonathan Crary uh, um, described and disparaged in, in 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 that book you know where commerce and labor a demand to be done at all times, and that's a serious and 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 disturbing phenomenon. Even even uh, those who those of us who live that way still want to hold on um, to the idea that 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 it's Thursday uh, today or Friday for you. So um, if I learned anything from uh, reflecting on this question, as I have a, a lot since finishing the book, uh, it's that the week is r remarkably easy. Uh, to entrench and remarkably difficult to uproot. Uh, so uh, I, I don't doubt that the things that we're talking about uh, make a difference. I just am not persuaded that they're really going to get us to to care less about the week and more about some other kind of calendar system. Um, before we come to the end of the end of this interview, you, you've written some really fascinating books, uh, and this book was published in 2021. So I'm wondering if there's any other project you're currently working on, any other books uh, we might expect sometime soon. Yeah, well, uh, I am uh, hopefully finishing soon a book about the history of baseball. Um, wow, <laughs> completely different. <laughs> it is. The only connection is that it the uh, it is a book to, about something that essentially has its roots in 19th century mm -hmm. America. Um, I'm also uh, working on a longer project about the history of political partisanship, um, mm -hmm. which is connected uh, only again because of its yeah. roots in 19th century America, but also uh, is a little bit about the experiences and mentalities of ordinary people. I'm interested not in um, how political parties uh, fomented or exploited partisanship, but how ordinary people felt mm. partisan allegiances and so it mm. it it gets me to some of the same kinds of documents that i that i've used for my earlier mm. books mm. Well, i think it's a very timely topic as well given the political it climate is. not only in the united states but i guess in other parts of the world as well think, including yours as well. <laughs> yeah 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 but unfortunately it's not as heated as it is in the united states but uh it's a global phenomenon it's everywhere in, in, yeah. in europe germany america yeah Yes, so uh, I'd like to understand it on a psychological mm -hmm. level a little bit by looking at at when political parties, mass political parties, spread uh, in mm -hmm. in the United States. Because I'm not a very athletic person, so I guess your second book is more aligned with my interests, and I'm I'm keeping my eyes open. Hopefully, uh, yeah, we should be able to talk very soon about your new book when whenever it's out. David, to. thank you, yeah. thank you very much for your time uh, to speak with us on New Books Network. Thank you for your questions. That was great. So. Yeah.